Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to session two of Creating a Buzz About Bees in Ontario. Uh, my name is Karen Fisher and welcome to those who are joining us again for uh, that, that were here last week. Um, and uh, I'm joined by uh, actually tonight a few of my colleagues, uh, Carolyn Puderbo, um, who you would have met last week as well as well as um, uh, John Mullenheis. And John is gonna be speaking to us tonight about costing and pricing. And uh, my other colleague, Maguire Nididin, um, will be speaking to us about business supports and services through OMAFRA and the vendor engagement program. I think we touched on that a little bit last time. So uh, again, welcome. Um, we are really pleased to be um, uh, you know, involved in these sessions with the Ontario Beekeeping Association. And um, these sessions are aimed at uh, providing uh, information and resources on how to sell food, honey in your case, and honey and high products in the Ontario marketplace. And um, as I said, this is session two of four, and we have um, a pretty full agenda tonight. And uh, looking forward to hearing from our speakers and um, hearing from you as well. So um, I'm just going to start with a um, territorial acknowledgement. Um, I would like to acknowledge that I'm located in the village of Consecon, which is an indigenous name meaning an opening and pickerel located in Prince Edward County. I live and work on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Huron-Wendat and Haudenosaunee nations. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties, specifically the Crawford Acquisition from 1783. The land that I preside on today lies on unceded Indigenous territory. I live adjacent to the Tyndanaga Mohawk Territory and I am grateful for the richness that this community brings to the region. We come to this land as uninvited visitors and we promise to treat the land and community with the utmost respect as Indigenous peoples have done for thousands of years before us. My learning journey has led me to a much deeper understanding of Canada's historic and present relationships with the First Peoples of Turtle Island. And through that learning, I acknowledge the intergenerational systems that exist and continue to dis disproportionately harm and exclude Indigenous communities and peoples. I am actively making decisions in my own life and acting in a manner in both my work and personal life that are advancing reconciliation as set out in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 Calls to Action. Um, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Melanie, who is going to introduce Ian. Good evening, everyone, and thanks again for joining us. Um, I just want to appreciate everyone taking the time out of their busy schedule. I know September is a little hectic for beekeepers, but uh, we appreciate you coming out and uh, um, enjoying the sessions that are being provided here with our great guest speakers. Uh, I am going to, yes, and turn it over to Ian Grant, of, uh, first vice president of the OBA, uh, to speak to some of the things that the OBA is up to right now. Thank you very much, uh, Melanie, and, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me bring up my presentation for you. And welcome to this evening's um, uh, online workshop presented uh, by uh, in concert with OMAFRA and uh, with the OBA. Uh, as Melanie mentioned, I am the Vice President of the Ontario Beekeeping Association. And very quickly this evening, I would like to uh, give you some background on the Ontario Beekeeping Association, maybe uh, you're aware or maybe not. Uh, we are the OBA, we are the voice for Ontario beekeepers, both at the provincial level and at the federal level. Uh, with our stakeholders at the provincial level, uh, working with uh, OMAFRA and other agencies at the provincial level, and at the federal level, working through the Canadian Honey Council. And what we do is work on issues that affect the health of honeybees, the operation of beekeepers, and the operation and business of beekeeping. What we offer uh, through the OBA is the opportunity to support Ontario beekeepers uh, and the beekeeping industry, again, working with our stakeholders and governmental uh, partners and university researchers and institutions. We advocate on all, on all occasions for bees and beekeepers' interests. 
We are committed to responding to the issues that are of concern, uh, not only for to honeybees, but also our beekeepers and through our members uh, and their local associations. You probably are aware if you are a member of the OBA, uh, the benefits of belonging to the OBA. But if you aren't, uh, there's a small list that I presented uh, for you this evening. Um, at the very least, we are we enable you and allow you to connect with other beekeepers throughout the province. It's a great opportunity to, to speak with other beekeepers throughout the province and you know, through their own associations. Uh, we provide subscriptions to our bi-monthly Ontario Bee Journal, the OBJ. And if you're not aware of that publication, uh, I urge you to uh, pick up a copy and peruse it uh, when you have a moment. Um, back in 2019, when the last World Conference was uh, held here in Canada, in Montreal, Apiamandia 2019, the OBJ won second place silver medal of all the beekeeping journals throughout the world. So a very, um, a very important resource, I believe, for our members to uh, take a glance at. Uh, in addition, we, uh, through the Canadian Honey Council, uh, provide a quarterly uh, subscription to the Hive Lights, the Canadian Honey Council's journal. We offer direct links through the Technology Transfer Program, the TTP. And there are other sub-associations uh, that you can gain access to, whether it's the Ontario Bee Breeders Associations, uh, Association, the Ontario Honey Bee Selection Program, the Ontario Honey Bee Pollination Association, or the Mead Makers Association of Ontario some great opportunities for you to liaise with other bee, uh, beekeepers. Let me uh, switch uh, tax for a moment. Um, we have a strategic plan in the OBA to help guide us on our journey uh, over the years. Uh, this is the last version that was issued in 2013 for a five-year period. But of course, with the pandemic, um, a few things uh, have taken a backseat, and this is one of them. But uh, we are refreshing our strategic plan. We're building on the things we've done in the past and hopefully uh, looking at new opportunities for the future. We have a working group that's in session now made up of OBA staff members, board members, beekeepers, and a consultant. And we're engaging with a variety of uh, groups, such as our, um, our OBA members, external and industry stakeholders, et cetera, to update this plan to give us the inspiration on where we should go for the next five-year period. Now, of course, to accomplish this, it's just not just the staff at the OBA, but it's a variety, we have a variety of committees in the OBA, and we've spent the past year revitalizing those committees to bring in new volunteers to help share in the workload and to use, utilize the very specific skill sets and knowledge that the volunteers bring to the table. So what we're looking for today and for the future is an engaging mix of volunteers, whether you're, you are a beekeeper or not, whether you're, you are a new and, or an experienced beekeeper, whether you're small scale or a commercial beekeeper, we're looking for volunteers who are interested in working on behalf of all of our membership and of Ontario beekeepers. So if you are one of those types of individuals, we urge you to consider volunteering, looking at our committee structure, coming up uh, with an idea of where you'd like to fit in and working with us. Very quickly, we have a series of committees that you can join, whether it's internal communications and external communications, education committees. In general, we have a spot most likely for you in any of these committees and even some of the working groups. Once again, we, the OBA, is the voice for Ontario beekeepers on issues that are of concern to you as a beekeeper and of honeybees. We'd like to know what's on your mind, find out what are those issues that concern you and help us help you and work with us on the changes that we'd like to make in the province. If you're looking for more information about us or our committees, uh, if you're looking to volunteer, please join us at our website, ontariob.com. There are points of contact. You can reach out and talk to either Melanie or myself, and we would love to hear from you. Thank you very much and enjoy your uh, your online workshop this evening. Thank you so much, Ian, uh, for that uh, um, intro on um, um, OBA. And uh, it's it's really um, interesting because, um, you know, you're talking about the, you know, your strategic plan for your organization. And it's such a great segue into uh, the next topic that I'm just going to be touching on. Um, you know, it's it's um, one of those things, and and I think we heard from one or two people last time um, that uh, they don't necessarily have a business plan, and they're quite successful. And yes, absolutely, like it's it's um, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that you know if you don't have a plan, it doesn't mean that it, you aren't going to achieve success. Um, I 
I am a strong advocate for planning, um, whether it's a business plan or a strategic plan. And um, uh, I think it's really important just to help yourself kind of organize your thoughts and figure out which uh, direction that you would like uh, your company or your organization to go in. So um, I, I'm just going to walk through some really basic information on business planning, and this may be um, really uh, um, high level. It is very high level and, and uh, much of a repeat for some, um, but I just want to highlight the importance of um, having a business plan. And so what is a business plan? Um, really, it's uh, um, a tool that can be used uh, for the creation or expansion um, of any business. Um, and it, it's really kind of that game plan. It's that whiteboard, you know, you have your vision and then you have uh, how all, all the steps that you're going to take on how you're going to achieve that vision. And whether it's, you know, you're starting up and you want to, um, you know, sell to retail or you're starting up and you want to educate others, um, it, you know, whatever your, your goal is or your vision is for your company, it's really good just to lay it all out in the form of a uh, business plan that does describes your product or service, your customers, your competition, and so on. Um, and again, like I said, you know, it really just sets out, um, uh, you know, gets you to think about um, a lot of different things and, and um, um, set them in some kind of order. So um, why plan? Um, a good plan helps you, as I said, to define your goals. Um, it also outlines roles and responsibilities. So, um, you know, you as an entrepreneur, um, you may have strengths in certain areas, but you may require some help in other ways. Um, you know, you may require some marketing help or some financial, um, you know, keeping your books in order, help, that kind of thing. So understanding who's playing what role um, in, your, in your business. And another thing that a business plan can do is as part of your business plan, you're going to set out some um, sort of benchmarks to achieve along the way. And so, um, you know, as you're moving through and achieving success in these different elements of your plan, um, you can see where you're making progress and you can see where perhaps you might need to change lanes or um, pull back a little bit and, um, you know, kind of rethink how you're going to get to the place you want to be. Um, and, you know, the other thing about a business plan is it will provide that essential documentation if you're going to the bank or if you're going uh, looking for any kind of, um, um, you know, funding, uh, funding uh, going to any funders um, for various funding programs, um, a business plan, a solid business plan is something that's required. And it does take time. Um, and it's it's something that uh, you need to, um, you know, very strongly have a hand in. Um, it's, I don't, it's not something that you can just say, here, you go do this. Um, you know, you and your team, whether that's your immediate family members or, uh, you know, other members of, of, your, of your business, um, uh, you know, everybody needs to be involved. So, you know, just to get started, um, you want to just take a look at your business idea and uh, think about the purpose of your business. And, you know, we heard last time from, um, you know, several presenters and, you know, their, their business models are very different and what their product is, um, is, is also different and how they sort of achieve their vision um, was very different and very interesting to hear um, the different stories that people had on, on how how they, they um, sort of evolved their business to what it is today. Um, think about the specific market that you want to fill. Um, and, um, you know, John tonight, my colleague, um, is going to talk about costing and pricing. So, you know, um, is it, um, are, are the, it, are your target customers willing and able to purchase your product or service? Um, are your personal and business goals um, smart, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely? Um, and do you have the skills and ability and resources? And if you don't, where could you source those? Um, and, you know, think about funding and starting up a business or expanding a business and where are those funds going to come from? And, um, 
uh, you know, are you going to, are you, are you willing to take the time to build the plan? And, um, um, you know, again, I'm a, a strong uh, proponent for business plans um, just because they can help you lay out um, all of these, all of these things. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, there was a bit of humor injected there. Um, what should be in your plan? Um, so, uh, you know, this this is just uh, an, an outline and there are many others and, you know, others that may be, um, you know, the, the titles may be more relevant to the particular service or, um, you know, the way that your business is going to evolve. So, um, but this is sort of the general uh, content of a business plan. And um, uh, again, you know, this is it's not a cookie cutter. So you need to make it your own and, and yours may look very different from this. But, you know, I think these are some of the key topics that you're going to want to cover in your business plan. So is um, a business plan worth the effort? Uh, it's hard work. And uh, there are many successful businesses that advocate having a business plan. Um, as I mentioned, funders, venture capitalists will require it. Um, but at the end of the day, you're the one that will benefit the most because it will help you put your, um, you know, vision into, uh, you know, some semblance of order and, and create a map on how you're going to achieve it. So now, um, John um, Mullenheis, John, I'll, I'll just let you introduce yourself and your role at OMAFRA. And John is going to talk, uh, speak to us tonight about costing and pricing. All right. So I'm um, just trying to get the, the chat function up here, too. I just want to tuck that off to the side just to hopefully get that in there. So, yeah, these things we've already talked about. So I'm, I'm going to be spending my time on the cost and pricing for. Um, for profit, and, and I'm John Mullenheis. I've been with the ministry now for 22 years, working in business analysis and cost of production. I work out of the Brighton office. And so I spent a lot of my time on the costing side and a lot of it on the on farm costing, like cost of production for on farm products. And, uh, and, and so, but of course, like on the pricing side of things, the costs always play into that as well. So we're going to be touching on sort of the costing piece and then how that how that factors into the, the pricing of these. And um, and if you're working on farm, if you've got multiple enterprises, you you recognize that there's there's it's a challenge uh, putting these together. And and I will say this sort of up front, the value added presents a challenge as well. And it becomes and costing out can be a challenge. So I'm not here to say it's easy. It, it does take some work. To put, but uh, I'm gonna hopefully present some some tools and some um, some information that'll that'll sort of help you and try to make some decisions on potentially different ways you want to go and and some ideas on the costing side of things and some of the considerations you need to be uh, thinking about on on that side. So we'll just get into that. And I know marketing channels was dealt with last week as well, so I'm not gonna till the same ground here, but. When you're thinking about it in the context of costing and pricing, of course, the channel you're looking at, the costing and pricing will be impacted by that. So there's going to be, um, you know, different costs when you're looking at the two, you know, the two broad buckets, if you will, of of marketing channel options. So you got the direct marketing options where you're receiving the full retail price, or the wholesale market where you're receiving a share of that price. Now you're receiving a share of that price. But the other folks involved are sharing in the costs as well. So they're taking on different things. So the cost side of things is going to be different on the wholesale side of things. So it is kind of important to sort of think in those terms that, you know, they're, they're, the costing piece is going to be different. So some of the cost um, considerations are going to be different depending on the market channel. And, and another one of the things here as well is that, it doesn't have to be an either or. Like it, it's not like you have to be direct marketing. That's what you do. You could have a mix of things. And, and it's not like you have to start with direct farm market and go into a farm market and then build yourself to a, uh, to a wholesale market. It, 
you can have a combination. You can start anywhere and it doesn't, and you could be successfully direct marketing and, and never get into the wholesale side of things, just depending on what your business goals are and what you'd like to achieve on that side of things. So it's not that there's one, you know, one progression through these marketing channels, but it is some of those things that you need to be thinking about because there are, there are going to be differences across, um, across that. So when you're thinking of it in the direct, uh, context, you know, the customer turnover and the grand brand recognition is pretty well yours and yours alone. Other than like, if, if you're in the farmer's market, you know, some of that advertising, some of that promotion is shared within the farmer's market and, and it's more of a team effort that way. But if you're on farm sales, then that marketing effort is your own. So, so when you're thinking about it uh, from the standpoint of, you know, your marketing costs, those will be solely yours and you know, the labor costs are going to be different between the two uh two avenues the direct and wholesale so in the direct you're doing a lot of the the labor piece obviously to get it to retail either if you've got an on-farm retail or if you're manning a stall at the farmer's market that's going to be your labor that you're looking after where the wholesaler is then taking on more of that marketing piece and more of the labor beyond the farm gate, if you will, they're they're looking after that uh, that piece of it. So that's the pieces that they're sharing. So they so that price is going to reflect that, right? So on the direct side of things, you're getting full retail price. For wholesale, you'll be getting something less than full retail because the wholesaler is looking to make uh, you know make their margin on the things that they're looking at, right? Because there's there's pieces in the supply chain that they're looking after, so they're going to be want, want to be compensated for it and, the, and for the whole supply chain to work. That's what it's going to have to work out to be. And then on the wholesale side of things, the, the volume commitments can be different. Typically the, you know, like I say, the pricing, the margins are going to be a, um, less on the wholesale side of things, but the volumes could be greater. So you could be looking at increasing the volumes because they've got increased marketing efforts, increased uh, networks that you may not be able to reach yourself. And where in direct, you've got more control over that full retail price of what you set as a retail price. Obviously, competitors and what the consumer will pay will, will have an influence on that. But with the, the wholesale, you may have some ability to negotiate a price with them, but they're certainly going to want to uh, negotiate a price that works for them as well. So there's going to be some uh, price pressure on that side of things. So margins will be different for the wholesale. And Delivery is going to be different. It's not driving to the farmer's market on Friday and Saturday. It's delivering to a certain point and maybe on a certain schedule. And you might, may also have to deal with bad debts, which is something you got to think about when you're costing that out, what kind of a percent of bad debts were. In the retail setting, you don't have that. You, you receive the, the, uh, the, the retail price as soon as, as soon as they pay for it, where with the wholesale, there is the, uh, the, the chance of, of bad debts of not receiving those accounts receivable that you have. So those, some of those considerations that you have um, that you need to be thinking about on the different marketing channels. So, so that's why I say the marketing channel you choose, and you could have a combination of these, right? So it's not one or the other, but the cost side of things and the pricing side of things are going to be different. So where I say, you know, on the value added side of things, it can be more challenging. And one of the reasons is because of that, because every channel that you're looking at could have a different costing scenario and the pricing scenario is going to be different and the things that you think that you need to be thinking about will be different. So um, it is it is a challenge, it takes some work to get get there, but uh, but it is certainly one of those things that you need to be thinking about. Certainly on, and what we're going to talk about first here is on the cost costing side of things um, is what you want to be um, you know, looking at and, and what are things that you need to consider on the cost side of things. And this is just something I found from a, from a US, U.S. university. And, and some of it applies a little bit to fruit and vegetables, maybe like the reusable plastic crates and the washing and sorting equipment, maybe a little more on the fresh um, fruit and veggie side of things, but could apply in, in these situations. But it just gives you a sense of what things may be taken care of by the other person. And, and I want to just point out, sort of all the NAs and the whole side, wholesale side of things that you as a producer don't necessarily have to think about. Like, you know, 
these things are the things that are taken care of by the wholesaler where the farmer's market and the farm stand, the home on farm retail stand, they're fairly similar across the board, some differences. Um, but the wholesaler then takes on a fair bit of that marketing piece and the sales piece. So there are some, you know, those things that you, uh, you know, need to be thinking about from if you're going to be doing that direct market that will not be a factor in the wholesale side of things. So that though these are the things that the the wholesale, the restaurant or the grocery or the distributor will be will be taking care of for you. So it, it's not necessarily a consideration. So depending on what you want to want to do and, and whether you like that direct farm marketing or whether you just want to hand it off to a wholesaler on that side of things is the considerations you need to be having in, in those. And each one of these direct versus wholesale has different cost scenarios and different things that you need to be thinking about on the cost side of things to um, to factor into your costing where, you know, in the wholesale, there, there's a lot more that they're, they're taking care of for you that standpoint so what we're going to do is we're going to just have a you know walk through a bit of a case study just to you know try to apply some of the concepts that that i'm talking about here today so so we're just going to have and you know i did adapt this from a scenario that we had before so hopefully it, it still sort of applies on the honey side of things or the bee side of things but uh but we'll be working through these here so we've got beth and patrick they own a farm They've been running it for 10 years with some uh, starting with bees and honey production. They're, you know, selling all of their product now at the local farmer's market. They had a lot of high mortality last year. So they ended up buying in bulk honey because they wanted to keep their market stall and they wanted to keep their, their customers. So they, you know, they use that as a, uh, a way to do that as far as buying in some bulk honey and, and pack packaging their honey that way. And then, Throughout the season, then they decided, well, they, they really like the honey side of things or the, like the, the honey product development, the bee product development side of things rather. So they're thinking, well, maybe instead of growing in the number of hives, maybe we want to grow a little bit more on the value added side of things. We want to be getting a little bit more into that product development side of things. So, so they rented a commercial kitchen from a local church and invested in, in the labeling, nutrition labels that they needed. And so now they've got more capacity to, to develop more products and they're thinking about well maybe you know do we continue with the farmer's market or do we need to explore some wholesale customers as as well so they're they're looking at uh you know those kind of options here so we'll work through this as a bit of an example just for, sort of working through some of the concepts here so so on the cost side of things where to begin if you're looking at your accounting software or what you your statement you come from your accountant it likely looks something like this as far as just, you know, has your sales on top and then a laundry list of all the expenses in no particular order. And this is just a greenhouse example that I had. So I don't want you focusing on the numbers at, um, at all, but it's, it's more sort of the idea that, okay, well, you've got this laundry list. How do we make sense of it? How do we start trying to make decisions on it? How do we start trying to work through a costing exercise with, with this, where do, where do we begin from here? And, one of the one of the ways is to sort of put the expenses into categories, and you may have heard these before. And if you've heard cost of production sessions before, you certainly would have heard sort of the you know the main components of a cost of production are your variable costs and your fixed costs, and then you know breaking that you know categorizing the, the variable costs and the fixed costs, and then the gross margin is your sales minus your variable costs, and the cost of goods sold is a a term that's that's common within other industries is starting to become a little bit more talked about in the farm uh, in the farm scenario, but it is sort of a common term in other industries and and certainly on the retail and restaurant and food services side of things you see that term used a lot. So and they're looking at that gross margin a lot. So it's it's helpful within this context for you to be thinking in that way as well. So this is sort of taking that big laundry list and sorting it through and putting it into these uh, different uh, different categories to help you start making some decisions on it and, and thinking about what how things can change. So, and again, I don't want you to focus on the numbers here. Like the numbers are, are it's more about the process here 
it's just more about sort of working through the process. Don't get too hung up on the numbers and, and saying, well, how do how would you ever get that number? It's more about the process. And like I say, this was adapted from another example that had, had as well, but I kind of put it into, you know, a honey context uh, to give you a little bit more of a, a flavor within yours. And, and so variable costs are costs that vary with the output of production. So if you're producing a thousand jars of honey, and you move to 2,000 jars of honey, your your variable costs are going to double, right? So it's going to be, you know, it's it's not going to be 340. It's not going to be 680 a jar. It's going to be per jar, right? So if you're doing a 2,000 jars, your honey cost is going to double. So it directly, uh, their production level is directly impacted um, by the very, uh, the variable costs are directly impacted by the level of production, and it moves in, um, in direct in direct relation to the production so as the production moves up or down this these variable costs will move up and down as well so so the variable costs are those things that change with the with the level of production so these are the things that all honey producers are doing we'll get to the fixed costs not all of the you know not all of the fixed costs are, are typically you know would be uh, you know, would be applicable or or it, you know relevant to each one of the each one of the farms. It can be you know how you you know how you look at uh, how you run your business, how you thought your your uh, you know the infrastructure, the buildings, those kind of things are going to be unique to you. Where these variable costs will be the same. All honey jar producers will have these these costs in there. So it's in it becomes a relevant number that people can can look at and here you've got honey some of the things to think about is is honey here okay this is a nice tidy one line on a number but if you're producing your own honey there's a whole another cost of production budget you've got for honey that will feed into this and we'll talk a little bit about some of the things on there and why you might be looking at that piece of it but that honey number is a nice tidy number here but if you're producing it yourself which most of you are because you're all beekeepers then that honey cost of production will be another component of of this um, if you're buying in all bulk then that number may just be one but uh, that's not likely the case for for most of you and and so some of the other things to thinking about on the variable side of things on the production labor side of things you know some of the things just to be mindful of is you may be paying you know minimum wage of 15 dollars an hour for for labor that's not going to be your total labor cost, right? Because you've got your employer deductions. That would be, you know, your your CPP and your employment insurance and your uh, your insurance, your, like your workman's compensation insurance and the vacation pay amounts that have to be paid by the employer. Um, so you need to factor those in. Yes, $15 goes to the employee, but there's other costs that are attached in, into that. So that you need to be thinking about those things when you're, looking at the cost side of things because there's going to be additional cost to that labor cost other than what you're directly paying to your employees so just be mindful of that because that can be another 15 20 percent on top of your labor uh, when you're adding in those other employee employer deductions that have to come off of that as well other things to think about on you know jars and lids and label side of things Right. Yeah. So, and, and production labor, this is what I'm saying. Like production labor is, is the direct labor related to production. And, uh, and when we get to the fixed cost, there will be sort of the administrative labor that's part of that piece of it as well. So this is the labor that's, you know, directly part attributable to the production of the, of the, you know, of the honey, right. The, the actual production process. So, um, so yeah, so you're right on that side of things, but, um, so on the, on the jars and lids on the label side of things, you know, things to think about here is, uh, you know, you you got to factor in breakage in into these as well. Because if you if you buy a hundred jars and you break three, then that, you know, the, that cost for a hundred jars is now spread across ninety seven jars because that's the only saleable uh, jars that you have. So you need to be thinking about that side of things. Is that you know, yes, you've got you know, a dollar per jar charge that you get from your supplier, but they're going to be, um, you know, 
th that won't have any breakage factor into it. So you need to be thinking about that side of things and, and getting this understanding of whether that's uh, what level that is, is something that you have to be thinking about yourself. But so those are the variable cost side of things. And then the fixed cost side of things, these are the things that are independent of the production level. So if you move from a thousand to 2000, these costs may not change. Now, you know, they, they can be incremental. And that's why we say stays consistent within a range. If you get beyond the uh, the capacity of the, you know, Beth and Pack, get beyond the capacity of that kitchen, then they're looking at a bigger facility and that facility rent will, will change. But for this year, if they're looking at, you know, producing, you know, within that facility, then that's just going to be a fixed cost. So some of these things, you know, can be, semi-fixed if you will some of them may change but they do not you know move in direct relation to the the production like the variable costs do so uh, so they may be incremental as you reach certain capacity levels or you reach a certain level where you need more labor then those things can can factor in um, and this is where i say like non-production labor is factored in into here so that's that's more the administrative roles and and some of the more uh, you know uh, non-production related uh, labor that's included in in that piece of it there so uh, so then so these are you know the fixed costs that you're looking at so some of the things that I just uh, would just point out uh, through here is as you know property taxes if you're doing some on-farm retail or some on-farm processing you want to be thinking about okay well I, you know, if, if it's on farm, then you may be looking at a different classification in, in assessment with, uh, with impact. If there's a, you know, more of a retail or a, or processing facility on, so on your farm. So they may assess that portion of your farm property differently as more of the commercial class and taxed at a different class. So it's just, it's not something that, uh, uh, is, is there a way to find out? Well, I mean, you can talk to MPAC, uh, and, or you can talk to like accountants typically, uh, you know, may may have some experience because they, they would have seen some of the different uh, uh, so some of the different tax coming through there. So uh, so talking, you know, try to get in contact with MPAC or or with a local accountant that is working with, you know, that, that may be working with different uh, uh, different on farm marketers that would have that experience. So those are a couple of different avenues that you can. Uh, that you can look at for um, for that piece of it. So, um, so if you if all you do is honey, then this fixed cost is easy because you don't have to do it allocating. But that's typically not the case, right? Um, yep. Thanks, thanks, Alan. Yeah, uh, give impact, and they'll they'll be able to give you some um, direction on there. But if you've got if you if you've got multiple enterprises and and most of you do and, and most of you have multiple products that you've got to got to uh, try to come up with some kind of an allocation scheme for the fixed costs and and admittedly there's as much there's as much art as there is science to this so allocating those uh, allocating those fixed costs a lot of you know a couple of common ones is the percent of gross sales so if honey is forty percent of your gross sales. Then forty percent of your fixed costs gets allocated to that. A more detailed way is that percent of gross margin, so that revenue minus variable costs, because that gross margin is what's left over to pay for the fixed costs. So if you've got enterprises that are contributing more to the fixed costs, then then they could be allocated more on that side of things. So those are two common ones that you can think about, but you do have to come up with some kind of an allocation scheme that makes sense for your fixed costs. Another thing that to that's a common thing that's overlooked and and you know it's the the farmer entrepreneur math is is not valuing your time uh, because you're 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 not paying yourself a wage unless you're a corporation and so you've uh, you know but especially in the, in this in the context of wh whether you're trying to set a retail price you want to make sure for a sustainable business that you're being as comprehensive as you can with the cost which is including a cost for yourself, like compensating for your time and compensating for the use of personal vehicles if it's being used in delivery. So make sure that you're uh, looking at all of those costs that you may not necessarily have, uh, you know, a cash cost out for some of those to the business, especially if it's your time. But you need to be, you know, what's your replacement value? If you weren't there or if, the, you know, the coincidence of somebody driving on Thursdays into town, 
you know, to drop off things, just, uh, you know, the coincidence is nice, but what happens if that no longer is the case and you have to you know, find some way to either truck it yourself or, or finding somebody to ship it, you need to be mindful of, of that. So, um, so you can have a look at, uh, you need to be making sure that you're, you've got that factored in. So, and like I say, that honey was a nice tidy number on the top, but you need to go through now if you're, you're, and I think most of you are producing your own honey. So you have to go through, okay, what's my cost of production? So you have to do the same thing of looking at the variable and the fixed costs for your honey and trying to figure out what's my total cost of production. So I know what that number is when I'm looking at my product cost. When I'm looking at the jar of honey, I know what that product cost is in, included in, in there. Um, so you need to be looking at, at all of those factors in there. And, and it may come down to some some of you, I mean, I know you're all making, you know, beekeepers and you're, and you're making honey. So you may not be thinking, okay, well, maybe I'll just buy in bulk and not do honey keeping, you know, beekeeping. But you may enjoy that. You may come to the realization, yeah, I, I like the product development. I like the different recipes. I like looking at all of the different things I can use honey for. So you may think, oh, well, maybe it's better for me to, to buy in honey and, and do all of those product testing ingredient recipe type type testing that I that I really like to do and and work it that way if, if that's something that you find out in the process that that's something I really want to do but uh, so you can look at at uh, that as a possible option but you really you know also have to be looking at how is my honey position so if I'm selling John's fresh from my hives honey I have to I have to you know be true to that right so I have to make sure that the you know if I'm selling it as my hives, then I can't just be buying in bulk. I have to be, you know, be true to to that if I'm doing that. So yeah, I don't, I don't have the answer how you can trust the wholesaler. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's probably like trusting anybody is, is getting some references and talking to people that have dealt with them. I, I would say that would be probably your best option. It's like trying to find a a good garage uh, or a good contractor, right? It's it's uh, you know looking at other people that are doing it, asking who they're using and and getting some references if you're looking at different wholesalers. Yeah, so, and uh, like I'm just looking at the question here that I missed how the, the equipment is, is costed out. Um, like I didn't get into that much detail as far as like depreciated over time. So, you know, you, you need to be thinking about, okay, how, how long, like, yeah, if, you, if you're investing in the high boxes, then, you know, and if they last 10 years, then you depreciate that over the 10 years. So then, so it's not a, a you know, it's more of a capital cost, so you've got to depreciate over that over the over the time. So, so yeah, we uh, I I just didn't have the time to delve into that much detail. But on the depreciation side of things, it is you know what's the the expected life of my asset, and then I'll depreciate that over the over the life. If it's ten years, then then you can do a simple depreciation of, of you know no salvage value at the end. You just simply depreciate that over the over the ten years, so that. Um, you know, so if anything capital in nature, that's what you're looking at. What's the expected life? And if it has no value at the end, then, then it's just a simple straight depreciation of an equal amount. You can do that. Or if there's value at the end that you're going to sell it for, then you take that off of that and you can depreciate the balance over the, over the life of the asset. And because you're dealing with live bees, you're going to have to be deal with dead bees as well. So, so there is, um, is, you know, you're going to have typical loss rates, right? I mean, if uh, you you can expect those. Um, um, yeah, thanks, Stephanie. Yeah, because if and I would like to hear from it, and it's more for the benefit of everybody else. Of how do you handle it when? Yes, there's going to be you, you expect sort of a normal loss of maybe it's you know twenty thirty percent or whatever the normal loss is for you. But what happens if it's sixty seventy percent? You know what what are you looking at? Uh, you know because you you've got potentially loss in revenue, loss in, in honey production, loss in, you know, the rental income from the pollination. And you've got some additional costs of, of rebuilding those, rebuilding those hives. Um, and uh, so, you know, there's the additional cost and the loss of revenue as well. So it's just a matter of, you need to be thinking about that in your pricing because that's going to be a factor because you're already dealing with, with live insects here. So there's going to be death loss. And, but you have those exceptional years in, in in there that uh, you know I, I was just kind of interested to know what folks how folks had 
had dealt with that in the past, whether you, you know, you try to incorporate it in the pricing, but if you don't have the honey, if you're in a farm market, yeah, maybe you, you know, don't have to, you know, you you have the honey you sell, but if you're in a wholesale, you may have expectations of certain volumes. And so you have to deal with those, uh, those as well. So. So that's so that's on the costing side of things, and and I know I've gone through this uh, uh, fairly quickly, but it's just so you need to be thinking about you know, and the variable costs are going to change with the level of production. So you think about those differently, and then the fixed costs is as you know, getting as much production so you can spread those fixed costs across as much production as you can. So because they are um, fairly fixed to the production level, based on the production. So you can spread those fixed costs across as much production as you can to, to control your fixed costs. So, so that's more so on the costing side of things. And again, it's it's a challenge if you've got multiple enterprises and if you've got some on-farm things and you're doing some value added, it can be even more challenging, but it comes down to record keeping and, and accounting software is getting better at putting that stuff together so that you can, um, looking at those uh, things within the accounting software, enterprising those out, but then, so now you've got your cost. So now you, you know, how do I use that cost and try to making some decisions? And the, one of the first things you can do is start looking at some break evens. And and this is when you know that break even point is where revenue is equal to spent expenses. So you're not making any money and you're not losing any money. So you you know here you're trying to say what is my break even production? So based on the numbers we have, uh, but up here they're selling, you know Beth and Patrick are selling their their honey for twelve. Dollars a jar. The variable cost was six twenty-eight. Their fixed cost. So the formula here, then you know the the gross margin on the on the denominator, uh, ninety-five hundred fixed costs. So you get sixteen hundred jars of honey. So then that gives you that idea. Okay, well, you know, if that church kitchen has capacity to do two thousand, and and you've got markets within your farmers market of of a greater than 1600 then you go okay well that, that's okay but if that if that number is then 4000 my break even is 4000 and i i don't have capacity to even do 4000 then you've got to start relooking at some of the numbers uh, some of the numbers on on that side of things so uh, this number can then just help you then kind of guide you okay well what are is the is that number reasonable do i think i can get over that because you know, once you get to sixteen sixty one, that's when you're in the money, right? So you're starting to make make money because all of your costs are are covered on that side of things. So, uh, so you need to have that kind of an assessment on the break even yield, and then the break even price, also known as your cost of production per unit. So again, it is you know, and here with Beth and Patrick, we're saying they're going to be selling three thousand jars of, of honey at the at the farmers market. So. The calculation is your total costs over the total total production. So your fixed and variable costs divided by that number. So their cost of production is nine forty five. So so that that's their cost of production. That's their break even price. So now they can start looking at you know from the the retail side of things. You know for their direct farm market, they're saying okay in that market we need to be pricing at least you know nine forty five. But because nine forty five you're you know, hopefully you've included your own number, your own labor in there, right? But looking at, you know, that becomes your becomes your ceiling on that side of things. So you can start using that as as the basis for thinking about pricing. And so putting these those numbers then into that five line income statement here, Beth and Patrick. Um, I just have to watch my time here. I think I just want to make sure I don't uh, uh, don't cut myself too short here and, and go over. Uh, so here you've got to, you know, this is the, you know, the whole farm statement or the, the business statement, you know, you've got not just on a jar basis, the, the total numbers here. So the, the 36,000 in sales and their total, their variable costs were 18,000. So they had a gross margin of 17,000, their fixed costs, and then, you know, an income before taxes in a positive, that's always a good thing, right? Uh, but then. The margins then become something once once you know as you get more history then you can start looking at these margins and watching those margins and this becomes a kind of a, a you know a nice dashboard for you to be watching these numbers you know so what's my variable cost what's what's my fixed cost what's my gross margins what are those 
what are those percentages doing over the years and then start benchmarking yourselves and setting some targets for yourself on, on those side of things. So, uh, so you can start using those numbers um, for benchmarks. So, so that's the, that's the costing side of things as far as, uh, you know, trying to put uh, some of those, some of those things in and thinking about costing and making sure that you're including all of the costs into your cost of production, especially if you're in the, in the context of setting a retail price. If you're in a commodity market, like if you're selling grain corn, you know, you don't, you don't, you're not a price maker, right? So it's a price taker. So, so, but if you're a price maker, you want to make sure that all of those costs are included in that. But in the pricing context here, it's not, cost is certainly an important factor, but it's one of the three factors that you want to be looking at within the pricing framework. And, you know, costs become the floor. Obviously, you want to be covering your costs. But then the competitors and the consumers then become the ceiling. Or, you know, what? how much are consumers willing to pay? And what are the, you know, consumers... You know, who is my consumer? What customer segment am I, am I going for? And, you know, not all customers are the same and not everybody is your customer. So you need to be thinking about who am I targeting? And, and maybe I'm not in the same customer segment. You, you don't have to necessarily be in this, yourself personally in the same customer target. You, you could be targeting somebody, uh, your customer target could be different. So it, just to be thinking about, and the consumer here is, your end consumer that I'm thinking about. So it, it's the people that the end user of that product that, that you're selling. So it's um, so even if you're whatever channel you're in, it's that end consumer that you're thinking about. What are they willing to pay and trying to come up with some, uh, some ideas of what the, um, what the, the numbers may be or what they may be willing to pay. And then the competitors, you need to be looking at the competitor side of things. Uh, you know, if you weren't around, who is supply what you're doing and looking at different, you know, from a direct farm marketing standpoint, it's, it's an easier thing to identify your competitors because you, you know, the retail markets, you can, uh, you can look at for you know, the different competitors and, you know, there's lots of online ways you can, you can look at current retail pricing or doing some, you know, shopping on your own and different retailers to find out what comparable products are, are doing. Wholesale is a little trickier trying to find out who your competitor are and, and what they're getting as far as what they're receiving for a price because it's not necessarily it's not the retailer right because it's an intermediary potentially that um, that is in the middle there that that may have a factor in that as well so it may not be the producer so it can be trickier I mean you can you know some ways you could be talking to you know you know chefs and food service or, or the buyer for a retail and try to get a sense of what a comparable product they'd be paying for um, if they're willing to give that kind of information, but it is trickier from a, um, from a, uh, a competitor standpoint on the wholesale side of things, but uh, you need to be sort of thinking about what are those things so that the competitor and the com consumer then become, you know, I know what my costs are, what's sort of the upper limit or what are some of the upper um, uh, reaches of what the prices could be. And, and on the competitor side of things, you know, what things are different from yours? How are you unique from your competitor? So maybe the competitor is selling it for $12 a jar, but yours is a specialty uh, specialty ingredients and, and a specialized process that you're doing that nobody else is doing so you can sell it more uniquely so that you could get $14 a jar. So if, you, if you're unique, then you can position it that way as well. And so the next few slides here is just to give you a little bit of sense of some of the folks along the supply chain and some of the margin realities across the supply chain. So you get a sense of what the, you know, the, you know, the other links in the supply chain are, are involved in or what the, their margin realities is. So you get a sense of that. So when you're looking at the wholesale avenue, you've got some, you, you know, these numbers can give you, you some bit of a background of seeing where your product may may land in this. So, so here are the restaurants and food service. Uh, so you see like the cost of goods sold, again, a common number in other industries. So 34, 34%, 34.5% .5 is their cost of goods sold is sort of what the, the average Canadian, now this is gonna be different for, if you've got a high-end 
you know, a high end store that, that that's could be a little bit more versus, you know, a, you know, a, a subway or a Burger King or those types of things. It could be, um, you know, differences there, but this is sort of the average Canadian food service. So there's going to be differences across, but this kind of gives you a sense of where some of those margins are again, slim, slim profit margins and for food service and retail inventory turnovers that, you know, flow through in the restaurant and inventory turnover in the retail is, is what makes them the money. It's, it's the, you know, they, they have slim, uh, slim margins on there. So you just need to be thinking about those kind of things. So, so the average food service, you know, they're, they're looking at, you know, these are some of the margins that they're looking at. So they're trying to keep their cost of goods sold around that 35. And this doesn't change that much. Actually, I just updated this slide from, from, uh, you know, the numbers had been 10 years old at this point. And the numbers didn't change, but maybe a percent or more because they are averages across. So, but they don't change an awful lot. I think they're they're fairly reasonable targets. Uh, one other thing to th be thinking about here is that salaries is a is a big portion of food service. So, if there's anything within your product that can help to reduce some of the labor, like if it comes in, you know, prepared in a certain way, that you know that they don't you know, their, their food service doesn't have to prepare it, then that can be a selling point for you if you're looking at the food service food service realm. So this gives you an idea on the food service. This is, uh, you know, on the grocery store side of things. This is, uh, you know, just looking at some, you know, again, there's going to be variations depending on the grocery store that you're looking at, whether you're looking at a no frills or, a, or Whole Foods uh, it will be differences, but this will give you kind of a general sense of what some of the, the margins are. Uh, for some of these, so so this was this was an independent grocer that supplied some of the numbers, but I did pass these by some of our business development folks, and they said, yeah, they're fairly reasonable for you know any in the grocery grocery chain side of things. So they can be kind of used in in a bit of a uh, bit of a sense that way for for you. So you know, overall, the store is looking at you know a twenty five percent gross margin or seventy five you know cost of goods sold in that area. But it is going to vary by product. So the fresh produce is going to be different because they've got to account for for waste. So they're targeting sort of a 30, 32 percent gross margin or they were grocery. So what they're willing to spend on their cost of goods sold may may differ depending on how what's the probability of damage. And, you know, processed products like a jar of honey will have less waste. Uh, so they may be willing to uh, offer a bit more on the, on the purchase price side of things because they don't have to factor in waste on that side of things. So this just gives you a, a bit of a sense of where the grocery stores and retailers are. So then you can start thinking about that when you're looking at, uh, you know, possibly working within that wholesale or the supply chain avenues. And a lot of, you know, larger retailers and uh, food, food service um, outlets will want to work through an intermediary. They want to work with 20 different clients. They want to work with one wholesaler, one broker, one distributor. And they all, you know, they all work on different, slightly different models. Brokers don't own your product. They don't buy the product. They're just a sales agent for you. A distributor buys the product from you and then sells it, but they have a, a you know, a margin mark. Each one of these has a margin markup. And the food hub is more of a, an aggregator of, um, products so that they can get enough product to be able to service a larger volume uh, retailer so that you, know, you can um, look at some of those. But they all have slightly different margins, but in that sort of 15 to 20 percent uh, range is what they're looking at for those intermediaries. So then you can look at it, you know, if you've got, uh, you know, a selling price, then you can kind of work through the math to get to, uh, you know, what a uh, potential retail price would be. So the distributor is looking to market up by 20%. So they're going to market up 50 cents that, so they're going to, you know, they're going to sell it to the retailer for three. So they bought it from you for two fifty, and they're going to sell it for $3 to the grocery store. And then the grocery store to get it from, you know, sort of an idea of what the selling price is. This is a processed product. So that was that 70% uh, cost of goods sold that they're expecting. So, you know, that's a 70% of their selling price. So you can divide the, you know, the, their purchase price by that 70% uh, cost of goods sold margin just to get to what an expected 
grocery store shelf price would be in the in that range of four twenty nine. So, so that would be the you know that thirty percent margin that they're looking for, a uh, gross margin that they're looking for for that product. So, you can do that with your individual products to kind of see okay, you know, these are the the, the, the steps in the chain. What are sort of what what would be this final grocery store price, and would be would consumers be willing to pay that, and would they be willing to uh, uh, willing to to um, you know, and you can start thinking back in in and working backwards as well as far as trying to come up with what you know, looking at that potential retail price and whether that's you know consumers willing to pay. You can work the math backward backwards as well, right? To sort of think, okay, I can see a comparable thing on the shelf for eight dollars. How do I work that back to a you know what they're potentially I could get as a producer? So so that eight dollars. You know, using that seventy percent margin, so the distributor would be selling that to the grocery for five sixty. So you can, you know, so that's five sixty. The distributor is selling it for five sixty. So then the uh, the producer then you know they're they're looking at buying it uh, from the producer for four sixty seven. So taking that twenty percent margin off of there. So so the producer price would then be four sixty seven. So you can work it either way to sort of work it from your product's perspective or work it back for some comparable product, start working on some some ideas of what that might be looking like for yourself. So just getting back to our case study. Uh, so just looking, Beth and Patrick have an opportunity to go to a local restaurant or a local food or a kitchen store. Uh, so they're looking at, you know, what are some of the, the differences on, on there? So. The options here, the restaurant's willing to pay $10 a jar, and the fixed cost is gonna to drop to 6,800. Option two is a kitchen store, and they're willing to pay $9 a jar, and the fixed costs are gonna to drop to 6,500. So the, the fixed costs drop because you no longer have, like you're, go, you're working through the wholesale market here, so, so you no longer have some of those farmer market expenses, and the kitchen store is a little less in fixed costs because they, they have a bit more storage, so they can actually, you, you have to ship less frequently. So uh, that was some of the assumptions made on here. So those, you know, fixed costs are expected to be lower in the, in the wholesale side of things because they are taking on, the wholesaler is taking on more of those costs for you. So, so now working through some of those numbers, so what do you, what do, you do next? So what's my first step? So some of the things you can be doing is, Working on these break evens again. So, what's my break even volume? So, for the restaurant, my fixed cost is now sixty eight hundred. Reduced margins here because that was ten dollars. So, I need to sell eighteen hundred jars of jam. Where you remember it was sixteen hundred with the farmers market. That was eighteen hundred dollars. Eighteen hundred jars of jam in the kitchen store because there's they're even offering less. They, they have reduced fixed costs, but the volume. Um, you know, you'll need to break even is twenty four hundred. So, so the margins get get uh, get finer. So you have to start, start thinking about okay. Well, the next question is what are they willing or what are they we're looking at for orders? So in our scenario, we're saying the restaurant's willing to four thousand, and they're looking at five thousand from the kitchen store. So your break even is eighteen hundred. So if you can get four thousand, then yes. So but if your if your break even with your costs came out to Five thousand, and, and the restaurant was expecting only um, only four thousand. Then, then you need to be thinking, okay, what's is that the right marketing channel for me? So, um, but you may be thinking as well, why would I even look at nine dollars a jar when you just told us earlier that it was nine forty five is my is my cost of production? So, so we need to be looking at the break even price here because in the different marketing challenges, the break even price changes as well because your fixed costs change. Um, and, and the volume changes. So you look in the restaurant option here, my cost, my break-even price is now $7.98 a jar and it's $7.58 for the kitchen because the fixed costs have reduced and you're spreading that fixed cost and the total cost across more production. So uh, so the two, uh, you know, that price volume um, dynamic is, is at play here as well. So so you need to be doing this for each one of those marketing channels because the costs change and the volumes change that you need to be looking at some of that costing side of things to, to make those assessments so that you say, 
So you don't jump at, well, $9, I am not even thinking about that because my cost of production is nine forty five. You need to be looking at the at the full picture. So then the, the uh, you know, just putting it into our, you know, five line income statement here, just looking at the different ball, different, uh, different marketing channels here. So the we already had that one for the farmer's market. Option one was the restaurant. Option two was the, the kitchen store. So, you know, the, the restaurant's looking pretty good, but the, the kitchen store is, is less than the farmer's market. So you may be thinking, well, that's, that's an opportunity for maybe me in the, in the restaurant. Maybe a, an opportunity to still do both, right? As far as you, know, you, may, you may have extra capacity that you could look at wholesaling options within the, uh, you know, outside of your direct marketing avenues. Um, or you may decide, okay, well, maybe I should go all all to the retail. If I if my production is only four thousand, right, then all of my production could go to the restaurant. But if my production is ten thousand, maybe some of that's going to my farmers market and some of that's going to the restaurant, um, and just just different scenarios. But this gives you a bit of a sense of what those numbers could be, and and gives you, a, you know, sort of a quick snapshot of the differences on there. So. And one other thing to note here as well is, you know, the gross margins are declining because the the margins are tightening, but it is that price volume dynamic that you need to be keeping an eye on as well. Because yes, the margins are, are tighter within the wholesale, but the volumes typically are greater. And that's one of the reasons you're looking at the wholesale is the opportunities for more sales. So uh, just some of the things to be thinking about. So your gross margin percentages may be, may be smaller in some of those, but because of the increased volume, it may be, uh, may be a, a good option for you. So in making the decision, so we, you know, on the financial side of things, we're talking about all those today very quickly, uh, granted, but you know, the costs are gonna be different depending on the marketing channel. Um, oh, sorry. Yep, I was just I was trying to pull up my my chat here as well, but it. Uh, so yeah, the it, it, your costs are going to be different on each one of these margins. The margins are going to be different, so you need to be calculating those, uh, you know, in those break evens on each one of those marketing channels to come up with those. And and it's important to remember that the costs are going to change in each one of those. So you need to be doing those break evens for each one of those and coming up with those. But those those need to be, you know. There's other things to be thinking about as well. Like if you're looking at, you know, if you're on the wholesale side of things, then maybe I want to go to the direct, maybe I want to go at the farmer's market. You know, operationally, do you have the ability to do that? Do you have the human resources to do that? Do you want to get into the marketing? Some people love that creative marketing side of things and other people just want to hand it off to somebody else. So that's, uh, you know, and, and how much control do you want to have on that on that product is, is some of those other maybe non- monetary considerations but things that need to be um, put into uh, um, into into that side of things so um, yeah i agree like staffer is a kicker on volume so I mean, yeah you've got you know you've got uh you've got to be looking at uh you know the the volume side of things yeah if you get beyond a certain point then you're going to have to be looking at at staff right so that can be a consideration when you're looking at volumes maybe you want to be looking at those higher higher margin areas because you don't have the volume and you don't want to be looking at the staff you want to be looking at you know it's a human resource piece i just want to be doing it myself i don't want to be hiring staff and i want to keep it within you know what i'm what i'm able to do so um so there may be some some of those uh, considerations um forecasting sales yeah so that yeah like the, you know cash flow budgeting i mean that's a that's a big piece of that so i mean it's you know you, you always put sort of a you know the you know, your typical scenario as you're forecasting those and then and then try to shock it with different uh different areas but yeah it yeah, and forecasting can be a challenge as far as that goes. It it can be a, a, a bit of a challenge from that perspective. So um yeah, I, don't, I don't have a good sense of sort of what the economies of scale is for you know how many hives do you need for that? I don't know if there's some some folks that uh, that have grown in the business that said, well, maybe there, you know, maybe some folks uh, you know, that are on, on this session can can answer that better than I can as far as you know. 
So where did they find was maybe a bit of a tipping point that, that you could start uh, making some money yourself. But, but those are some of those, you know, these are just some of the considerations that you need to be looking at and trying to make a decision of what those, those marketing channels um, are. So, and then, yeah, the, these are just the next sessions coming up. That's, that's all I had. So, you know, the consumer trends and marketing approaches next week and then uh, getting it into, and this, this is a good one as far as, you know, getting into those retail stores, there's lots of things to be thinking about as far as, you know, do you need to give free product? Do you need to give, you know, bundling those kind of things to get yourself and how do you get shelf space and those kind of things. There's, there's lots to be thinking about on that side of things. It's not as easy as just, you know, signing up with a retailer. Uh, there's lots of uh, different things you need to be thinking about on that side of things. So, um, but so that is all I had. I just wanted to open it up for questions now. How much do you need to make? So, so yeah, one hive, 20 kilograms of honey times $12 a kilogram, so 240. So that's sort of the raw honey. So that can give you, a, you know, you may have sales targets that you, that you want to hit. So you know, $240, how many hives do you need to get to the, to the amount of sales that you're, that you're looking for? So, so yeah, that, that can be um, a way to do that but yeah it's a lot of numbers and, and costing and pricing is a lot of numbers and i and i do costing you know for my job and and, and it's what i do is what i enjoy doing but I, I recognize that's not everybody's first love but uh lean on lean on your accounting software because a lot of it has some good abilities to do that enterprise analysis so yeah i, I realize there's a lot of numbers in there so yeah and um you know, one other thing, just uh, maybe there are opportunities through uh, networking with OBA, um, you know, to have some conversations around, um, you know, but, you know, um, what what is a break even and um, what are other people doing and how are they pricing their products? Like, I think, you know, there's... Um, uh, a lot of a lot of knowledge in the room, I guess, too, uh, that can be um, drawn upon. And um, so, thank you so much, John, again for a very comprehensive uh, presentation and much appreciated. And um, please pop any last questions in the chat if you have them, and uh, we'll do our best to get to them. Um, so, next up, we're going to hear from our colleague Meg. Um, Megawar and um, Meg, I will turn it over to you um, to uh, talk a little bit about OMAF for business supports and the vendor engagement program. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Karen. And uh, you, put, you put me at last, so uh, I have the duty of keep people uh, awake. <laughs> so I will try to make it interesting. And uh, it's a very long presentation to pre to 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 explain everything we provide to uh, the support that we provide to businesses. So I will just go over the most interesting part of what we do. And first of all, uh, my name is Magloire, uh, Magloire and and um, I'm a business development consultant uh, working out of Canville office uh, and covering Eastern Ontario. I, I wanted to start uh, by explaining a bit of what we do as a business development consultant. I like to say that our job is to keep food on the table, like just making sure that the food and beverage companies keep uh, stay in business and they are uh, successful. So we want to make sure that they, they grow and they, they, they expand and they continue to support uh, the, 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 food, the food and beverage sector. And uh, we work with uh, businesses of different sizes. If you are a small company, uh, it's just a small uh, producers or processor, or you are a very large multinational that is uh, located in Ontario, we don't make any difference. So we consider all uh, businesses as the same because sometimes those those small businesses are the one that support the local economy and we want to make sure that they are uh, fully supported. Um, I said uh, I'm covering uh, I'm, I'm working in uh, I'm covering Eastern Ontario so you will see here in gray the area that I cover so any business uh, located in this area fall into my uh, my um, 
my area of of of, uh, of work. So, um, but I also want to mention that we are a team. We are a team, a team of business development consultant uh, covering the entire uh, province. And uh, as you can see on my screen, I have uh, other colleagues that have also uh, experiences in other field of food and beverage because you cannot know it all. And they are also uh, sp sector specialists in the different uh, sector of food and beverage. So anytime I need uh, some expertise on maybe bakery or uh, beverage, I reach out to one of my colleagues to provide his own, uh, his own input and to make sure that we fully support businesses. In terms of uh, what we offer, we provide knowledge, uh, connections, and advice to businesses to make sure that uh, they, are, they, they, they are operating uh, successfully and uh, they can grow. And we also have businesses to start, uh, but we don't work too much with startups because sometimes you need, we need, to, uh, you need to make sure that you know everything you, that is required to, uh, to, to start a food and beverage like Karen just mentioned, you need to have a business plan and you need to have your market analysis. You need to have, there is a lot of work that you have to do before coming to us. If you're just starting, uh, usually we recommend you to start working with your local business center to make sure that you have all those aspects uh, um, covered. And when you are up and running, you can come to us and we will support you uh, to grow your business. And some of the questions that people uh, come to us, uh, some of the requests that we have, I just wanted to highlight some of them. Like for example, they are looking for a co-packer. Uh, they want to buy new equipment. They want to develop new products. They want to, uh, to expand, uh, expand their product maybe into retail stores. They want to modernize their production. They want to, uh, they want, sometimes they just want some business advice to know how to do better, uh, how to, for example, uh, sell their product online, I will say. So those kind of things, those we can support you uh, with, with those with those aspects of your business. And for companies that want to grow or to expand, sometimes they want to export their product. We have a team that will support you in the different steps to export your product. Sometimes they want to expand, maybe opening other uh, facility or locations, or they want to, uh, for example, uh, partner with other companies to grow. We kind of help you if it's a connection that you need, if it's a support, if it's a funding or anything, then we are able to, uh, to support you. Uh, I will go into details of um, some of the services that we offer. Uh, in terms of resources, we provide um, guides, business guides and uh, fact sheets for you to learn how to develop your business or for some specific aspect of your business that you would like to, to know better. Like, for example, if you are looking for a co-packer for your product, then we will uh, provide you resources to know if you need a co-packer at the stage of your business. Uh, the requirement from a co-packer, there is, for example, a minimum quantity that a co-packer will require to be able to work with you. And uh, if you want to do a private label, for example, we will tell you exactly uh, what it takes uh, to, to, to make a private label. If you need, for example, some uh, market reports, some stats, then we will be able to provide you uh, those, uh, those, 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 those information. And we often uh, also provide some trainings, some trainings covering different aspects of the, of the business. Uh, those can be uh, from the, I don't know, from the selling your product, marketing your product, or maybe exporting your product, the different step. And I will show you some of the trainings that we provide. Uh, in terms of resources, here are some, those are just some uh, fact sheet that I, I found uh, in our database, but we have a lot of that. So if you have any specific problem, uh, feel free to reach out and then we will share with you the, the right resources that you that you need. You don't usually have to go on Google to, uh, and spend a lot of time to search. 
and we can just email you the right resource that you need. Uh, we also have the, the food and beverage guide that we just, uh, we just updated. And uh, I just added the link here to the new version, the 2022 uh, version. And it contains a lot of information about uh, uh, start, uh, starting your business, about uh, marketing your business, uh, if you want to use a distributor or maybe a broker, uh, if you want to develop a new product, if you are looking for funding. So we have a lot of information that in, in that guide that you can also uh, take advantage of. In terms of training, we have uh, webinars that we provide. Uh, we also have some online uh, training, like for example, on food safety. Uh, and we have uh, in-person training, like uh, the profit uh, profit training that is coming this uh, uh, this November. Uh, that that will be uh, in Toronto. And uh, if you want to attend, then you will be able to learn the the basic the basic knowledge on uh, exporting your product into the U.S. It's very interesting uh, event. And uh, you will be able to also meet some people that will share their own experience on starting in export. And uh, you will know the different challenges and all the regulation around that. So I think it's a two days training and it's very, uh, it's, very, it's very interesting to attend if you're planning to export in the near future. Uh, then uh, I will go over some uh, business connections that we make. Uh, we are we try to connect uh, industry stakeholders. Uh, it could be uh, retailers that are looking for some suppliers in Ontario, and we have those requests very often. Sometimes you have U.S. companies that are looking for some specific products, and we connect them to the local producers. Uh, sometimes they they are based Ontario businesses that want to sell their product into retail stores. Uh, or maybe uh, expand their, their, their sales through private labels. Uh, we make those connections and I will explain the vendor engagement program uh, in a bit. Uh, we also attend uh, trade shows uh, and share some useful contact. For example, if you want to buy a specific equipment or if you want to uh, conduct some research on your product, we can connect you with, uh, with the right people. In terms of events, uh, I just put some of the events that we participate every year. Um, sometimes we organize like selling food to Ontario. Uh, sometimes we just uh, participate in those events, uh, but you will see uh, we have a lot of events where we participate and also where food and beverage businesses in Ontario can also uh, be. Uh, they can attend those events to promote your product. And when we do participate to those events, those can be uh, national or international. Some of them are happening in Europe, in the US or uh, in Ontario, or sometimes in Quebec, like the CL, for example, uh, was in, in Montreal. Uh, those events we participate and we make sure that we promote uh, the Ontario businesses. When we participate in those events, we always have a booth to sell Ontario uh, as the, the, the place for business, the place to grow your business. But sometimes we also have the Ontario Pavilion where we host some uh, Ontario businesses, uh, food and beverage businesses where they can promote your product. Sometimes we offer some discount for them to be able to participate and to, to promote their own uh, products. So that's what we do to help some businesses to be uh, in some trade shows. Uh, I don't know if there was questions so far, uh, but I will take the questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, then we have the vendor engagement program. Uh, the vendor engagement program support uh, some retail stores that want to promote the, the, the local lo, uh, local uh, sourcing of their product because with the pandemic uh, we see that uh, happening very often that they want to uh, promote the fact that they are uh, they are promoting local businesses they are uh, selling product that are made locally um, that is one part but also to make sure that they uh, don't face all the 
the, the problem with supply chain is that it's easier to source a product uh, here in Ontario instead of importing the product from California, for example. So we uh, have this program with some retail stores like Metro, Sobeys, Walmart, and others, uh, where we connect local producers with those retail stores. The, the last one happened uh, this uh, June in Belleville, where we uh, uh, have organized, we had about uh, 30 businesses that we invited to that event. And they had the opportunity to present their product to Metro uh, uh, buyers. Uh, there were three buyers and uh, they were able to present to have a 30 minutes presentation. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, Metro will tell you if they are interested uh, in doing business with you. If not, they will tell you maybe what you can do to be able to do business with them. And it's uh, one of the main events that we organize to make sure that we connect local producers to uh, to large retail stores. And if you need more information about this, uh, feel free to, to ask your question in the chat and then I will explain. Uh, in terms of business, um, in terms of business uh, advice, we provide general advice on business development. Uh, it could be any question that you might have on developing your business. I don't know much of, uh, of, of uh, honey production or beekeeping, but in terms of the business, selling your, your product, selling your food, then that is what we, that's what we do. Uh, we also uh, support businesses that want to export their product. So we have a team that works on that. Uh, we also support businesses that are looking for funding, funding opportunities, uh, sometimes in, uh, by sometimes I would say every time businesses, uh, people reach out to me and they want to have some uh, government support, government funding to be able to uh, maybe achieve some milestones or maybe to um, complete some project that they have. And uh, we support them in those uh, we, with our best advice to make sure that they don't waste their time applying to the funding that they are not eligible or if they're eligible that they have, we help them to, uh, to make sure that they present the product, their the, the project the best way to be able to, um, to obtain the, the, the funding. And some of the funding that we have covered, uh, for example, evaluation of the business potential, uh, development of a new product, uh, marketing, if you want to, if you have a new product and innovation and you want to market, that product in, in Canada, or you want to export your product, uh, if you want to buy a new equipment to improve your, pro your productivity, or maybe to improve uh, food safety and traceability, or, or any other uh, project that you might have. If you have a project, re reach out, and then we will see which program, if it's available, which program will be, uh, will be uh, more suitable for your project. We have uh, the CAP program that is now closed, but we expect that to reopen in the future. Uh, we currently, we're currently working on the Strategic Agri-Food uh, Processing Fund. We also have the uh, Eastern Ontario Development Fund, and we have a bunch of other programs from the federal government, uh, from other uh, ministries, and sometimes from other organizations that we can share with you uh, depending on your project and uh, what you're trying to achieve. Uh, here, uh, I'm talking about a CAP program. I found this one that is still open and that cover uh, be, uh, beekeepers. Uh, these two programs are still open. If you're interested, you can go over those and uh, and see if it fits your need or the, uh, the, the, the uh, an ongoing project that you might have. And... Uh, if you need any advice, feel free to reach out to us and we will be happy to support you. Now, if you want to stay up to date of any program or any news or any other opportunity that we uh, provide at Omafra, uh, we all have our monthly newsletter that we share. Uh, we have uh, trainings, we have uh, the different events that we are attending and uh, we, we have the different um, funding opportunity for opportunities. For example, if you're interested, here's the link. You can just subscribe 
and then you will receive uh, you will receive a newsletter every month. And if you want to uh, contact me, here are my contact information, and I will be happy to help. And that's all I had for you. Any question? Thank you so much, Meg. Um, so much information jammed in a short period, right? Um, but I think the most important takeaway is that, um, you know, Meg and his team of business development consultants um, are available uh, and they cover um, Ontario. So um, and links again uh, will be in the presentations that are sent out to everyone. Um, so just um, I, I don't think I'm seeing any questions coming in for you directly, Meg. Um, Carolyn has posted in the chat a link to an evaluation. If you would please um, fill it out. It's really important for us that we know that we're kind of hitting the mark on the information that we're presenting to you. Um, and also just a reminder for next week, um, consumer trends and marketing approaches. So um, it'll be really uh, a, 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 a really interesting session. Foodland Ontario is coming in um, and um, we'll have some other presenters as well. Uh, and just in closing, um, there are a few extra slides that um, I had that just talked a little bit about some of the local business uh, supports. Um, and uh, there, uh, Alan, I think you asked a question. I'm not sure if you're still on, but you asked a question earlier about business planning. Um, and so small business centers and community futures development corporations that serve rural areas um, are a good place to go if you're looking to do a business plan. Um, and uh, look for some potential funding sources and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, also, um, they also have supports that are available. And there are a couple of funding programs that are outside of the sort of the normal ones that we think of um, also listed um, in the slide deck that you'll get. Uh, one is called the Carrot Cash. Um, and the other one just flew out of my head. I'm sorry. <laughs> um a fair finance fund, sorry. Um, so um, uh, with that, I will leave it there for tonight. And thank you so much for your attention. And um, um, we look forward to seeing you again next week. And thank you to our speakers, uh, John and Meg um, and Ian. Uh, thank you for your contributions. And uh, we look forward to seeing you.